Hi, everyone. My name is E. David Crawford. I'm a professor of urology at the University of California, San Diego. The title of my talk today is Early Detection of Prostate Cancer, Navigating the Challenges of 2021. I'd like to thank Dr. Faye Stern and the group for inviting me to participate in this outstanding meeting. My uh, goals here are going to be to the learning objectives of reviewing the guidelines for early detection of prostate cancer, understand the challenges of early detection, and develop a pathway forward. We're going to talk a little bit about guidelines. I'm not going to take a deep dive into all of these. American Cancer Society has guidelines. A lot of these are based on the informed decision and understanding the risks and the potential benefits of prostate cancer screening. The EIU has a lengthy a set of guidelines. They're very good. I, a lot of it focuses on what I have here on the screen, and that is multiparametric MRI. MCCN guidelines, again, good guidelines. Annual PSA talks about uh, early detection benefits and so forth, and then subcategorizes people. And also, again, heavily weights on informed decision and explain to the patient the pros and cons of early detection. The AUA has a very uh, long set of uh, uh, guideline recommendations, uh, including when to start screening, what age is not to, like 40 to 54, that uh, the benefit of screening may not be beneficial in men that, uh, in, unless they're within one age group, and, and especially some men over the age of 70. The U.S. Services Preventive Task Force, we all remember, is the one that really sort of drew a line in the sand about the value of screening. They sort of tempered their feelings back in 2018 and then talked about uh, screening and, again, benefits of, and risk and harms and informed decision, some baseline PSAs and things like that. What we do know, and this is one of several publications last year, this was at GUSCO, that documented that the lack of intervention and early detection very quickly resulted in a rise in the number of metastatic prostate cancer patients. So I say, help, help, help. What are we going to do? We have these challenges. How do we go forward? How do we deal with the controversies? How do we deal with all the different screening recommendations and guidelines? Well, I ask this question to audiences uh, many times, and I say, are you satisfied with the current state of prostate cancer early detection? People scratch their head and they go, hmm, I don't think so. Rarely does someone say that they're satisfied with where we are with early detection. So the answers I heard from urologists and family practice doctors are a little bit different. They have different reasons, but they have common areas where they have controversies about per screening parameters, informed decision, benefits, right? But they, you know, they, they both kind of feel there is some benefit to early detection in the long run. I think we all remember PSA Airlines, Pacific Southwest Airlines flying high, early detection, so to speak. But then it sort of became the world's shortest vacation. U.S. Services Preventive Task Force gave a C recommendation most recently, but before that, it was a D recommendation. So let's talk about 1.5 as a cutoff for PSA, 1.5 nanograms per milliliter. Well, what we know as family practice doctors, and I'll show you this in a minute, are the ones who order over 90% of the PSAs, but we confuse it. We have different cutoffs, 2.5, PSA velocity, PSA density, age-specific PSA. We have all these markers, 4K, select MDX, and so forth. So they're, they're confused. They need something simple to go forward. And here's the data. Um, if we look at PSAs that are obtained in the United States, and a couple of large reference labs gave us this data, 90% of PSAs that are ordered are ordered by family practice internal medicine doctors. So what about a cutoff that's, uh, that, that's acceptable? This is our PLCO publication. And what we showed in this one and a couple others is that if you had an initial PSA and in this screening of less than one, 
then you probably didn't need to be screened every year, but it could be every five or even 10 years. So what I did was we went to a database that was very robust, the Henry Ford database in Detroit. And there were, we picked out men with a PSA between one to five, minimum follow-up of five years. And then the results were that we had 30% African-Americans, which is a, a, as you know, the African-American population has a higher risk of prostate cancer and aggressive prostate cancer. And we showed in this group that in fact, if you had a PSA of less than 1.5, your risk, of developing prostate cancer in the next five years based on 21,000 men was less than 0.5%. And very few of these had Gleason pattern seven or above. However, if you were 1.5 to four, you can see here that it went from seven up to 10% uh, risk of prostate cancer. So we concluded that 1.5 is a danger zone. But it doesn't just mean cancer, it circulates around prostate health. The most common cause for a minimal elevation of PSA is BPH. So that's looking at prostate health. Large prostates, more risk of progression of urinary symptomatologies. Also, prostate cancer and these PSAs, these isolated PSAs, can in fact be a long-term predictor of who's going to get into trouble with prostate cancer. Now, one of the first criticisms we hear, oh my gosh, if we start have a cutoff of 1.5 or less, and 1.5 to 4 is when we're going to have a problem with and evaluate, we looked at 400,000 PSA tests from our bioreference lab, and 73% of men having their PSA done were less than 1.5. So we're talking about maybe evaluating 25%. But as I mentioned, PSA of 1.5 and above, most, the most common cause is, is enlarged prostate. And this is a publication that we had years ago from the MTOP study showing that as the PSA increases, so does the size of the prostate. So it's a good surrogate to look at. This is our publication in, the, in urology uh, several years ago around that PSA of 1.5 cutoff. So let's take another look at this as we go forward. Okay, one of the things we hear a lot about is informed decision. And yes, informed decision is important, but think about it. When you go to your family practice doctor, do they get informed decision when they check your lipids, your electrolytes, your weight to your blood pressure, they tell you, if you have an elevated cholesterol, we start you on a statin. You may, in fact, have rhabdomyolysis, renal failure, and die. Do they talk to you when they do a cardiogram or, or talk to you about your heart? Do they tell you that, uh, that uh, if you have hypertension, that if we put you on a drug, you could have um, a hypotensive episode, fall, hit your head, have a subdural, and have a problem? So when do they talk to you about the side effects and the informed decision after they do the test. Why is PSA any different? 73% of men require no discussion. And there are studies that have been done, many of them, and this is one just recently in JAMA showing with all these decision aids and usual care things that in essentially decision aids didn't add a lot to what happened to the patient. So you can, we can argue all we want about informed decision, but in medicine, family practice, it's when the test is abnormal. Why don't we do that with PSA? So our clinical needs basically are here. We need a simple message for family practice doctors, 1.5. I just showed you all these different guidelines. You think they're gonna remember those? Do you think that urologists are gonna remember those? Informed decision should happen after you have an abnormal test routinely performed. 90% of PSAs, as I mentioned, are by family practice doctors. Now, what we wanna do is focus on identifying significant cancers and stop doing needless biopsies. Early detection, clinical needs, we've gotta find significant cancer. So what I can say today is PSA alone to guide prostate cancer bias or prostate biopsies rather should end. We need better risk assessment stop unnecessary biopsies, reduce overdetection, find significant cancers. We have these tools now, they're called molecular markers. What we have here, Sigurd mentioned in her talk, 
that using 4K score can be helpful in, in determining who needs to get a MRI uh, and biopsy. But again, this is a rel relatively complicated diagram. I wanna talk about a paper that we would just published in prostate cancer and prostate diseases in May of this year. I had the, the uh, unbelievable opportunity to work with a lot of our European colleagues, including uh, Eel Behrens and Jack Salkin, who um, started has done a lot of molecular research, looking at something called Select MDS, which is a urinary test to predict high-risk prostate cancers or indolent ones. And what happened in that study, 599 men and uh, had a PSA so greater than three. They had both select and, and uh, multi-parametric MRI. High-grade cancers in the 599 were present in 183 of the people. Uh, select had 38% negative who avoided biopsy. Multi-parametric MRI, just a little bit better. 49% negative, avoiding biopsies. And if you look at high-grade cancers, select missed it about 10% and multi-parametric MRI uh, missed about 5%. And what the conclusion was, if you have an outstanding MRI unit and radiologist to read these, but there may be an advantage of using the MRI, uh, but in, the, in a lot of places where costs and other things are, that are an issue, the select followed by, if the select test is positive, the MRI appears to be the way to go. So this is one large trial that proves that. So in summary, I think we need something simple to go forward. Uh, we put this out a number of years ago, routine PSA, less than 1.5, come back in about five years, greater than 1.5. And then what you do is you do considered looking for BPH as a cause, uh, maybe referral to the urologist. Some family practice doctors could do molecular markers. If you do a molecular marker, there's several of them out there, select MDX, 4K, phi, and there's just a, a many more coming down the pike. If they're low risk, go back into the pool. If they're high risk, trust biopsy. So with that, I'm going to end. There's a lot of controversy about PSA and, and early detection, but I think we all believe that the way forward is to have a simple message that the doctors that order the most PSAs have the opportunity to remember a cutoff and then proceed forward with a molecular marker or something to determine who the biopsy. This happens in medicine all the time. If you have an elevated blood sugar, do they start you on insulin or metformin? No, they do an A1C hemoglobin. If you have a abnormal cardiogram, do they ship you off for a bypass? No, they study your vessels and determine it. If you have an elevated PSA, we need to follow that same sort of uh, way forward. We need to think about doing molecular markers. Thank you.